Welcome back. In this video we're going to look at a couple of examples of subgroups and showing that they're subgroups using the tests. And we're also going to define a particularly useful construction called the cyclic subgroup. Um, so we'll give you the definition and prove that it's a subgroup and we'll discuss it in quite a lot more depth a bit later on in the course. Okay, so here's the definition. Oh, and this thing is called a cyclic subgroup. We'll prove that it's a subgroup, subgroup in a minute. But for now, we'll just give you the definition. So the definition is that the this thing here with the left and right angle brackets and A in the middle is just the set of all integer powers of A. It can be infinite, it can be finite, depending on the group you're working in. And it's called the cyclic subgroup of G generated by A. So you put the generator, which is A, inside the angle brackets and you take that to mean the set of all integer powers of A. Okay, and since we're calling it a cyclic subgroup, we'd better verify that it, that it is, <laughs> in fact, a subgroup of G. Okay, so we're going to pull in our subgroup tests. Um, we'll go for the one-step test. Uh, so first off, to use the one-step subgroup test, we need to verify that our set is non-empty. So first off, we'll just make a quick note that A itself is a member of this set because if I choose n equals 1 that gives me a and so a is definitely a member which means that the set is non-empty. Again it's the kind of thing that's quite easy to forget to do but we need to justify that, that the set we're talking about is non-empty before we try and show it's a subgroup. Okay so now we're going to use the one step test which means we need to choose two arbitrary elements of our set and then show that one times the inverse of the other is a member of the set also. So we will choose let a to the m and a to the n be members of this set. Okay, so we know that all elements of the set take that form. So this is my two arbitrary choices arbitrary choices of elements of our set. Then we're going to do our one step test. We've got the, our two elements. We now want to take a to the m times a to the n inverse. And if we can show that that's in our subgroup, then in our set, then we know that we have a subgroup by the one step test. So that is equal to a to the m times a to the minus n. I can combine those two together as we discussed previously. And I can turn those into a single for a single exponent a to the m minus n. And all integer powers of a are a member of our cyclic subgroup. So that is a member of the set, which is what we wanted. So A is a subgroup. Okay, so now we can hand on heart say that this thing is indeed a subgroup and it's a nice easy way one to construct because we just take an element, we multiply it by itself until we get back to the entity or, or, or indefinitely depending on the group we get and that gives us a subgroup. Okay, so a couple of things we say. Just a bit of terminology, if G is equal to A, or if G is equal to the cyclic subgroup generated by some element itself, then we say that G is cyclic, and G is generated by A. So when we talk about a group being generated by something, it means we've made a construction like this one here. Okay, so A or A is a generator of G is another thing you can say. Okay, and the last little thing to note here is cyclic subgroups or cyclic groups are abelian. Even if the group itself is not abelian, the, sub, the cyclic subgroups are because a to the i a to the j is equal to a to the i plus j which is equal to a to the j plus i because addition is commutative which is equal to a to the j a to the i. So even if we're working in a group where the operation is not commutative, say matrices, any subgroup is still going to be abelian no matter what. Okay, so just to practice building these things, we're going to take a group 
that we know how to, that we kind of understand. So I'm going to look at u of 10. So u of 10 is all the numbers relatively prime to 10, and the group operation is multiplication mod 10. Okay, so that you can check pretty quickly. Those are the four numbers in question. So we're going to build the cyclic subgroup generated by each of these elements. So let's draw up ourselves a little table. Here is our element 1, 3, 7, and 9. So that will be our A. And then we'll put A to the 1, A to the 2, A to the 3, A to the 4. Okay, so A to the 1, so going through 1, so remember we're multiplying now, so it's going to be 1. And if I multiply by 1, it's going to stay at 1, so I'm not going to go any further. So I can write that the cyclic subgroup generated by my identity element here is just the set 1. So for each of these rows, I'm going to go through multiplying until I get back to 1, because once I got to 1, I'll go back to where I started the next time around. So 3, 3 to the power of 1 is 3, 3 times 3 is 9, multiply by 3 again, get 27, which is 7, mod 10, 7 times 3 is 21, which is 1, mod 10. And so the cyclic subgroup generated by 3 is actually the whole of u of 10 itself. Which interestingly means that u of 10 is in fact a cyclic group, even though it doesn't look much like one. Okay, so the same thing for 7. What do I get here? I'm going to get 7. is just 7 to the 1 is 7. 7 times 49, which becomes 9. 7 times 63, so we'll have 3. And 7 times 21. And so again, 7 is also a generator of u of 10. What about 9? Uh, 9 by itself is just 9. And then 9 9s are 81, so we get back to 1. Notice if I multiply by 9 again, I get back to 9 again, I'd repeat the pattern. So the cyclic subgroup generated by 9 is just the group including the members 1 and 9. Okay, that's, so that's all of the cyclic subgroups of u of 10. I can do the same thing for, let's do d4. Do a couple from d4. Okay, so remember, the D4 is just a set of four rotations. And then our four reflections, H, V, D, D prime. Okay, so if you need to refresh on exactly what those were, you may want to have a quick look back over your notes. Um, so if I want to take, for example, the cyclic subgroup generated by R0, well, I rotate by zero and then do it again. All I get is just itself. And so that's just going to be R0. If I took the cyclic subgroup generated by R90, or once is R90, do it another time, I get R180. Do it a third time, I get R270. And a final time, and I get back to R0. If I were to do it again, I'd be back to where I started and I'd loop around. What if we take the cyclic subgroup generated by one of the reflections? Let's take H. Cyclic subgroup generated by H is just going to be H. Then I do H again, and I get back to R0. Okay, so these are these are three examples of cyclic subgroups that I can build from elements um, of D4. And you can see that all of the reflection ones are going to be the same. And I've done almost all of the rotational ones as well. The only one that I'm missing here is R180. And that will be R180 and R0. Okay, and I guess we'll do one more little example. Let's do one in Z20. Let's just calculate the cyclic subgroup generated by 4. Again, same kind of thing as we've been doing in the past. 4, 8, 12, 16, and then I get back to 0. All right, so before we finish, we'll have a few concluding remarks, and then that will be this video. Okay, so we can think of our notation here, think of this cyclic subgroup generated by A as being the smallest subgroup of our group that contains the element A. Okay, so we cannot make a smaller subgroup that contains this element because you, you can see by closure it's automatically going to have to contain that cyclic subgroup containing A. So if we're thinking along those lines, we could generalize our notation a little, bit, a little bit. 
So we could say, we could generalize and say that the cyclic subgroup generated by some set is the smallest subgroup of G containing every element in our set. So for example, e.g., let's look at the complex numbers under multiplication. So this is the one that excludes zero. The cyclic subgroup generated by those two, we're thinking of the smallest subgroup that contains all of those things. And we've talked about this one before. That would be the set 1, minus 1, i, and minus i. So the way you can think about building this thing is by just taking different combinations of these elements, multiplying them together, until we can't generate any new ones anymore. Okay, or in the regular C, under addition, so let's just make that clear that we're multiplying, um, the cyclic, the same set of numbers would actually generate the whole of the complex numbers because we can add any amount of 1 and any amount of i and we'll get what we get. So it's going to be a plus b i, it'll give us all of the complex numbers with integer coordinates. Okay, so that would give us like a, a grid of dots on the complex plane. Okay, so that sort of kind of concludes our discussion on cyclic groups for now. Um, we'll look quite carefully at the cyclic subgroup structure of groups um, in quite a lot of depth. But for now, we've introduced the concept and we've done a couple of examples of uh, testing subgroups. So we'll leave that there for now and we'll see you next time. Ka kite anō.